The Magician's Nephew, Chapters 11 and 12. Chapter 11. Diggory and his uncle are both in trouble. You may think the animals were very stupid not to see at once that Uncle Andrew was the same kind of creature as the two children in the cabbie. But you must remember that the animals knew nothing about clothes. They thought that Polly's frock and Diggory's Norfolk suit and the cabbie's bowler hat were as much parts of them as their own fur and feathers. They wouldn't have known even that those three were all of the same kind if they hadn't spoken to them and if Strawberry had not seemed to think so. And Uncle Andrew was a great deal taller than the children and a good deal thinner than the cabbie. He was all in black except for his white waistcoat, not very white by now, and the great gray mop of his hair, now very wild indeed. It didn't look to them like anything they had seen in the other three humans, so it was only natural that they should be puzzled. Worst of all, he didn't seem to be able to talk. He had tried to. When the bulldog spoke to him, or as he thought first snarled and then growled at him, he held out his shaking hand and gasped, Good doggy, then, poor old fellow. But the beasts could not understand him any more than he could understand them. They didn't hear any words, only a vague sizzling noise. Perhaps it was just as well they didn't, for no dog that I ever knew, least of all talking dog in Arnia, likes being called a good doggy then, any more than you would like being called my little man. Then Uncle Andrew dropped down in a dead faint. There, said the warthog, it's only a tree. I always thought so. Remember, they had never yet seen a faint or even a fall. The bulldog, who had been sniffing Uncle Andrew all over, raised his head and said, It's an animal, certainly an animal, and probably the same kind as those other ones. I don't see that, said one of the bears. An animal wouldn't just roll over like that. We're animals and we don't roll over. We stand up, like this. He rose to his hind legs, took a step backward, tripped over a low branch, and fell flat on his back. The third joke, the third joke, the third joke, said the jackdaw in great excitement. I still think it's a sort of tree, said the warthog. If it's a tree, said the other bear, there might be a bee's nest in it. I'm not sure it's a tree, said the badger. I had a sort of idea it was trying to speak before it toppled over. That was only the wind in its branches, said the warthog. You surely don't mean, said the jackdaw to the badger, that you think it's a talking animal. It didn't say any words. And yet you know, said the elephant, the she-elephant, of course, her husband, as you remember, had been called away by Aslan. And yet, you know, it might be an animal of some kind. Mightn't that whitish lump at the end be a sort of face? And couldn't those holes be eyes and a mouth? No nose, of course, but then, ahem, one mustn't be narrow-minded. Very few of us have what could exactly be called a nose. She squinted down the length of her own trunk with pardonable pride. I object to that remark very strongly, said the bulldog. The elephant is quite right, said the tapir. I tell you what said the donkey brightly. Perhaps it's an animal that can't talk but thinks it can. Can it be made to stand up? said the elephant thoughtfully. She took the limp form of Uncle Andrew gently in her trunk and set him up on end, upside down unfortunately, so that two half sovereigns, three half crowns, and a sixpence fell out of his pocket. But it was no use. Uncle Andrew merely collapsed again. There, said several voices, it isn't an animal at all. It's not alive. I tell you, it is an animal, said the bulldog. Smell it for yourself. Smelling isn't everything, said the elephant. Why, said the bulldog, if a fellow can't trust his nose, what is he to trust? Well, his brains, perhaps, she replied mildly. I object to that remark very strongly, said the bulldog. Well, we must do something about it, said the elephant, because it may be the evil and it must be shown to Aslan. What do most of us think? Is it an animal or something of the tree kind? Tree, tree, said a dozen voices. Very well, said the elephant. Then, if it's a tree, it wants to be planted. We must dig a hole. The two moles settled that part of the business pretty quickly. There was some dispute as which way up Uncle Andrew ought to be put into the hole, and he had very narrow escape from being put in head foremost. Several animals said his legs must be branches, and therefore the great fluffy thing that meant his head must be his root, but then others said that the forked end of him was the muddier, and that it spread out more as roots ought to do. So, finally, he was planted right way up. When they had patted down the earth, it came up above his knees. Please stop here and answer question one. He looks dreadfully withered, said the donkey. Of course, it wants some watering, said the elephant. I think I might say, meaning no offense to anyone present, that perhaps for that sort of work, my kind of nose. 
I object to that remark very strongly, said the bulldog. But the elephant walked quietly to the river, filled her trunk with water, and came back to attend to Uncle Andrew. The sagacious animal went doing this till gallons of water had been squirted all over him, and water was running out of the skirts of his frock coat as if he had been for a bath with all his clothes on. In the end, it revived him. He woke from his faint, and what an awakening it was! But we must leave him to think over his wicked deed, if he was likely to do anything so sensible, and turn to more important things. Please stop here and answer question two. Strawberry trotted on with Diggory on his back till the noise of all the other animals died away, and now the little group of Aslan and his chosen counselors was quite close up. Diggory knew that he couldn't possibly break in on so solemn a meeting, but there was no need to do so. At a word from Aslan, the he-elephant, the ravens, and all the rest of them drew aside. Diggory slipped off the horse and found himself face to face with Aslan. And Aslan was bigger and more beautiful and more brightly golden and more terrible than he had thought. He dared not look into the great eyes. Please, Mr. Lion, Aslan, sir, said Diggory, could you, may I, please, will you give me some magic fruit of this country to make mother well? He had been desperately hoping that the lion would say yes. He had been horribly afraid it might say no. But he was taken aback when it did neither. This is the boy, said Aslan, looking not at Diggory but at his counselors. This is the boy who did it. Oh dear, thought Diggory, what have I done now? Son of Adam, said the lion, there is an evil witch abroad in my new land of Narnia. Tell these good beasts how she came here. Please stop here and answer question three. A dozen different things that he might say flashed through Diggory's mind, but he had the sense to say nothing except the exact truth. I brought her, Aslan, he answered in a low voice. For what purpose? I wanted to get her out of my own world, back into her own. I thought I was taking her back to her own place. How came she to be in your world, son of Adam? By, by magic. The lion said nothing, and Diggory knew that he had not told enough. It was my uncle, Aslan, he said. He sent us out of our own world by magic rings. At least I had to go, because he sent Polly first. And then we met the witch in a place called Charn, and she just held on to us when... You met the witch? Said Aslan in a low voice, which had the threat of a growl in it. She woke up said Diggory wretchedly, and then turning very white. I mean, I woke her, because I wanted to know what would happen if I struck a bell. Polly didn't want to. It wasn't her fault. I I fought her. I knew I shouldn't have. I think I was a bit enchanted by the writing under the bell. Do you? asked Aslan, still speaking very low and deep. No, said Diggory. I see now I wasn't. I was only pretending. There was a long pause. And Diggory was thinking all the time, I spoiled everything. There's no chance of getting anything for Mother now. When the lion spoke again, it was not to Diggory. You see, friends, he said, that before the new clean world I gave you is seven hours old, a force of evil has already entered it, waked and brought hither by this son of Adam. The beasts, even Strawberry, all turned their eyes on Diggory till he felt that he wished the ground would swallow him up. But do not be cast down, said Aslan, still speaking to the beasts. Evil will come of that evil, but it is a long way off, and I will see to it that the worst falls upon myself. In the meantime, let us take such order, that for many hundreds years yet, this shall be a merry land in a merry world, and as Adam's race has done the harm, Adam's race shall help to heal it. Draw near, you other two. Please stop here and answer question four. The last words were spoken to Polly and the cabbie who had now arrived. Polly, all eyes and mouth, was staring at Aslan and holding the cabbie's hand rather tightly. The cabbie gave one glance at the lion and took off his bowler hat. No one had yet seen him without it. When it was off, he looked younger and nicer and more like a countryman and less like a London cabman. Son, said Aslan to the cabbie, I have known you long. Do you know me? Well, no, sir, said the cabbie, leastways not in an ordinary manner of speaking, yet I feel somehow, if I may make so free as how we met before. It is well, said the lion. You know better than you think you know, and you shall live to know me better yet. 
How does this land please you? It's a fair treat, sir, said the cabby. Would you like to live here always? Well, you see, sir, I'm a married man, said the cabby. If my wife is here, neither of us would ever want to go back to London, I reckon. We're both country folks, really. Aslan threw up his shaggy head, opened his mouth, and uttered a long, single note, not very loud, but full of power. Polly's heart jumped in her body when she heard it. She felt sure that it was a call, and that anyone who heard that call would want to obey it, and what's more, would be able to obey it, obey it, however many worlds and ages lay between. And so, though she was filled with wonder, she was not really astonished or shocked when all of a sudden a young woman, with a kind, honest face, stepped out of nowhere and stood beside her. Polly knew at once that it was the cabbie's wife, fetched out of our world not by some tiresome magic rings, but quickly, simply and sweetly, as a bird flies to its nest. The young woman had apparently been in the middle of a washing day, for she wore an apron, her sleeves were rolled up to the elbow, and there were soap soaps on her hands. She had had time to put on her good clothes, her best hat had imitation cherries on it. She would have looked dreadful. As it was, she looked rather nice. Of course she thought she was dreaming, that's why she didn't rush across to her husband and ask him what on earth had happened to both of them. But when she looked at the line, she didn't feel quite so sure it was a dream. Yet, for some reason, she did not appear to be very frightened. Then she dropped a little half curtsy, as some country girls still knew how to do in those days. After that, she went and put her hand in the caddies and stood there looking around her shyly. "'My children,' said Aslan, fixing his eyes on both of them, "'you are to be the first king and queen of Narnia.' The caddy opened his mouth in astonishment, and his wife turned very red. You shall rule and name all these creatures, and do justice among them, and protect them from their enemies when enemies arise. And enemies will arise, for there is an evil witch in this world. The cabbie swallowed hard two or three times and cleared his throat. Uh, begging your pardon, sir, he said, and thanking you very much, I'm sure, which my missus does the same, but I ain't no sort of chap for a job like that. I never had much education, you see. Please stop here and answer question five. Well, said Aslan, can you use a spade and a plow and raise food out of the earth? Yes, sir, I could do a bit of that sort of work, being brought up to it like. Can you rule these creatures kindly and fairly, remembering that they are not slaves like the dumb beasts of the world you were born in, but talking beasts and free subjects? I see that, sir, replied the cabby. I'd try to do the square thing by all of them. And would you bring up your children and grandchildren to do the same? It'd be up to me to try, sir. I'd do my best, wouldn't we, Nellie? And you wouldn't have favorites either among your own children or among the other creatures or let any hold another under or use it hardly? I never could abide such goings on, sir, and that's the truth. I'd give him what for if I caught him at it, said the cabbie. All through this conversation, his voice was growing slower and richer, more like the country voice he must have had as a boy, and less like the sharp, quick voice of a cockney. And if enemies came against the land, for enemies will arise, and there was a war, would you be the first in the charge, and the last in the retreat? Well, sir, said the cabbie very slowly, a chap don't exactly know till he's been tried. I dare say I might turn out ever such a soft un. Never did no fighting except with my fists. I'd try, that is, I hope I'd try, to do my bit. Then, said Aslan, you will have done all that a king should do. Your coronation will be held presently, and you and your children and grandchildren shall be blessed, and some will be kings of Narnia, and others will be kings of Arkenland, and which lies yonder over the southern mountains. And you, little daughter, here he turned to Polly, are welcome. Have you forgiven the boy for the violence he did to you in the Hall of Images in the desolate palace of the accursed Charn? Yes, Aslan, we've made up, said Polly. That is well, said Aslan. And now, for the boy himself. Please stop here and answer question six. Chapter twelve. Strawberry's Adventure. Diggory kept his mouth very tight shut. He had been growing more and more uncomfortable. He hoped that, whatever happened, he wouldn't blub or do anything ridiculous. Son of Adam, said Aslan, 
Are you ready to undo the wrong that you, you have done to my sweet country of Narnia on the very day of its birth? Well, I don't see what I can do, said Diggory. You see, the queen ran away, and I asked, Are you ready? said the lion. Yes, said Diggory. He had had for a second some wild idea of saying, I'll try to help you if you'll promise to help my mother. But he realized in time that the lion was not at all the sort of person one could try to make bargains with. But when he had said yes, he thought of his mother, and he thought of the great hopes he had had, and how they were all drying, dying away, and a lump came in his throat and tears in his eyes, and he blurted out, But please, please, won't you, can't you give me something that will cure mother? Up till then, he had been looking at the lion's great feet and the huge claws on them. Now, in his despair, he looked up at its face. What he saw surprised him as much as anything in his whole life, for the tawny face was bent down near his own and wonder of wonders, great shining tears stood in the lion's eyes. They were such big, bright tears compared to Diggory's own that for a moment he felt as if the lion must really be sorrier about his mother than he was himself. My son, my son, said Aslan, I know. Grief is great. Only you and I in this land know that yet. Let us be good to one another. But I have to think of hundreds of years in the life of Narnia. The witch whom you have brought into this world will come back to Narnia again, but it need not be yet. It is my wish to plant in Narnia a tree that she will not dare to approach, and that tree will protect Narnia from her for many years. So this land shall have a long, bright morning before any clouds come over the sun. You must get me the seed from which that tree is to grow. Yes, sir, said Diggory. He didn't know how it was to be done, but he felt quite sure now that he would be able to do it. The lion drew a deep breath, stooped its head even lower, and gave him a lion's kiss. And then at once Diggory felt that new strength and courage had gone into him. Dear son, said Aslan, I will tell you what you must do. Turn and look to the west, and tell me what do you see? I see terribly big mountains, Aslan, said Diggory. I see this river coming down cliffs in the waterfall, and beyond the cliffs are high green hills with forests, and beyond those there are higher ranges that look almost black. And then far away there are big snowy mountains all heaped up together like pictures of the Alps, and behind those there's nothing but the sky. You see well, said the lion. Now the land of Narnia ends where the waterfall comes down, and once you have reached the top of the cliffs, you will be out of Narnia and into the western wild. You must journey through those mountains till you find a green valley with a blue lake in it, walled round by mountains of ice. At the end of a lake there is a steep green hill. On the top of the hill there is a garden. In the center of that garden is a tree. Pluck an apple from that tree and bring it back to me. Yes, sir, said Diggory again. He hadn't the least idea of how he was to climb the cliff and find his way among all the mountains, but he didn't like to say that for fear it would sound like making excuses. But he did say, I hope, Aslan, you're not in a hurry. I shan't be able to get there and back very quickly. Please stop here and answer question seven. Little son of Adam, you shall have help, said Aslan. Then he turned to the horse, who had been standing quietly beside them all this time, swishing his tail to keep the flies off, and listening with his head on one side as if the conversation were a little difficult to understand. "'My dear,' said Aslan to the horse, "'would you like to be a winged horse?' You should have seen how the horse shook its mane and how its nostrils widened, and the little tap it gave the ground with one black hoof. Clearly, it would very much like to be a winged horse, but it only said, if you wish, Aslan, if you really mean, I don't know why it should be me. I'm not a very clever horse. Be winged. Be the father of all flying horses, roared Aslan in a voice that shook the ground. Your name is Fledge. The horse shied, just as it might have shied in the old, miserable days when it pulled a handsome. Then it roared. It strained its neck back as if there were a fly biting its shoulders and it wanted to scratch them. And then, just as the beasts had burst out of the earth, 
there burst out from the shoulders of Fledge wings that spread and grew larger than eagles, larger than swans, larger than angels' wings in the church windows. The feathers shone chestnut color and copper color. He gave a great sweep with them and leaped into the air. Twenty feet above Aslan and Diggory, he snorted, neighed, and curveted. And then, after circling once round them, he dropped to the earth, all four hooves again, looking awkward and surprised, but extremely pleased. Is it good, Fledge? asked Aslan. It is very good, Aslan, said Fledge. Please stop here and answer question eight. Will you carry this little son of Adam on your back to the mountain valley I spoke of? What? Now? At once? said Strawberry, or Fledge, as we must call him now. Hurrah! Come on, little one. I've had things like you on my back before, long, long ago, when there were green fields and sugar. What about the two daughters of Eve whispering about? said Aslan, turning very suddenly to Polly and the cabbie's wife, who had, in fact, been making friends. If you please, sir, said Queen Helen, for that is what Nellie, the cabman's wife, now was. I think the little girl would love to go, too, if it weren't no trouble. What does Fledge say about that? asked the lion. Oh, I don't mind, too, not when they're little ones, said Fledge, but I hope the elephant doesn't want to come as well. The elephant had no such wish, and the new king of Narnia helped both children up. That is, he gave Diggory a rough heave and set Polly as gently and daintily on the horse's back as if she were made of china and might break. There they are, Strawberry, or Fledge, I should say. This is a rum go. Do not fly too high, said Aslan. Do not try to go over the tops of the great ice mountains. Look out for the valleys, the green places, and fly through them. There will always be a way through. And now, be gone with my blessing. Oh, Fledge, said Diggory, leaning forward to pat the horse's glossy neck. This is fun. Hold on to me tight, Polly. Next moment, the country dropped away beneath them and whirled around as Fledge, like a huge pigeon, circled once or twice before setting off on his long westward flight. Looking down, Polly could hardly see the king and the queen, and even Aslan himself was only a bright yellow spot on the green grass. Soon the wind was in their faces and Fledge's wings settled down to a steady beat. All Narnia, many colored with lawns and rocks and heather and different sorts of trees, lay spread out below them, the river winding through it like a ribbon of quicksilver. They could already see over the tops of the low hills which lay northward on their right. Beyond those hills, a great moorland sloped gently up and to the horizon. On their left, the mountains were much higher, but every now and then there was a gap when you could see in between these steep pine woods a glimpse of the southern lands that lay beyond them, looking blue and far away. That'll be where the Archon land is, said Polly. Yes, but look ahead, said Diggory. For now a great barrier of cliffs rose before them, and they were almost dazzled by the sunlight dancing on the great waterfall, by which the river roars and sparkles down into Narnia itself from the high western lands in which it rises. They were flying so high already that the thunder of those falls could only just be heard as a small thin sound, but they were not yet high enough to fly over the top of the cliffs. We'll have to do a bit of a zigzagging here, said Fledge. Hold on tight. They began flying to and fro, getting higher at each turn. The air grew colder, and they heard the call of eagles far below them. I say, look back, look behind, said Polly. There they could see the whole valley of Narnia stretched out to where, just before the eastern horizon, there was a gleam of the sea. And now they were so high, they could see the tiny-looking jagged mountains appearing beyond the northwest moors and plains of what looked like sand far in the south. I wish we had someone to tell us what all those places are, said Diggory. I don't suppose they're anywhere yet, said Polly. I mean, there's no one there and nothing happening. The world only began today. No, but people will get there, said Diggory, and when they'll have histories, you know. Well, it's a jolly good thing they can't, they have it now, said Polly, because nobody can be made to learn it. Paddles and dates and all that rot. Now they were over the tops of the cliffs, and in a few minutes, the valley landed of, the valley land of Narnia had sunk out of sight behind them. They were flying over a wild country of steep hills and dark forests, still following the course of the river. The really big mountains loomed ahead, but the sun was now in the travelers' eyes, and they couldn't see things very clearly in that direction. 
for the sun sank lower and lower till the western sky was all like one great furnace full of melted gold. It set at last behind a jagged peak which stood up against the brightness as sharp and flat as if it were cut out of cardboard. It's none too warm up here, said Polly. And my wings are beginning to ache, said Fledge. There's no sign of the valley without a lake with a lake in it, like what Aslan said. What about coming down and looking out for a decent spot to spend the night in? We shan't reach that place tonight. Yes, and surely it's about time for supper, said Diggory. So Fledge came lower and lower. As they came down nearer to the earth and among the hills, the air grew warmer, and after traveling so many hours with nothing to listen to but the beat of Fledge's wings, it was nice to hear the homely and earthly noises again, the chatter of the river on its stony bed, and the creaking of the trees in the light wind. A warm, good smell of the sun-baked earth and grass and flowers came up to them, and at last, Fledge alighted. Diggory rolled off and helped Polly to dismount. Both were glad to stretch their stiff legs. The valley in which they had come down was in the heart of the mountains. Snowy heights, one of them looking rose red in the reflection of the sunset, towered above them. I am hungry, said Diggory. Well, tuck in, said Fledge, taking a big mouthful of grass. Then he raised his head, still chewing, and with bits of grass sticking out in each side of his mouth like whiskers, he said, Come on, you two, don't be shy, there's plenty for all of us. But we can't eat grass, said Diggory. Mm hmm said Fledge, speaking with his mouth full. Well, don't you quite, don't know quite what you'll do then. Very good grass, too. Polly and Diggory stared at one another in dismay. Well, I do think someone might have arranged about our meals, said Diggory. I'm sure Aslan would have if you'd asked him, said Fledge. Wouldn't he know without being asked, said Polly? I've no doubt he's, he would, said the horse, still with his mouth full. But I've a sort of idea he likes to be asked. But what on earth are we to do? asked Diggory. I'm sure I don't know, said Fledge, unless you try the grass. You might like it better than you think. Oh, don't be silly, said Polly, stamping her foot. Of course humans can't eat grass any more than you could eat a mutton chop. Oh, for goodness sake, don't talk about chops and things, said Diggory. It only makes it worse. Diggory said that Polly had better take herself home by ring and get something to eat there. He couldn't himself because he had promised to go straight on his mes message for Aslan, and if, one, for, if once he showed up again at home, anything might happen to prevent his getting back. But Polly said she wouldn't leave him, and Diggory said it was jolly decent of her. Please stop here and answer question nine. I say, said Polly, I've still got the remains of that bag of toffee in my jacket. It'll be better than nothing. A lot better, said Diggory, but be careful to get your hands in your pocket without touching your ring. This was difficult and a delicate job, but they managed it in the end. The little paper bag was very squashy and sticky when they finally got it out, so that it was more of a question of tearing the bag off of the toffees than of getting the toffees out of the bag. Some grown-ups. You know how fussy they can be about that sort of thing. Would rather have gone without supper altogether than eaten those toffees. There were nine of them, all told. It was Diggory who had the bright idea of eating four each and planting the ninth. For, as he said, if the bar off the lamp post turned into a little light tree, why shouldn't this turn into a toffee tree? So they dibbled a small hole in the turf and buried the piece of toffee. When they ate the other pieces, making them last as long as they could. It was a poor meal, even with all the paper they couldn't help eating as well. When Fledge had quite finished his own excellent supper, he lay down. The children came and sat on each side of him, leaning against his warm body. And when he had spread his wing over each, they were really quite snug. As the bright young stars of that new world came out, they talked over everything. How Diggory had hoped to get something for his mother, and how, instead of that, he had been sent on this message. And they repeated to one another all the signs by which they would know the places they were looking for. The blue lake and the hill with the garden on top. The talk was just beginning to slow down as they got sleepy when suddenly Polly sat up wide awake and said, Hush! Everyone listened as hard as they could. Perhaps it was only the wind in the trees, said Diggory presently. I'm not so sure, said Fledge. Anyway, wait! Here it goes again. By Aslan, it is something. 
The horse scrambled to its feet in the great noise and a great upheaval. The children were already on theirs. Fledge trotted to and fro, sniffing and whinnying. The children tiptoed this way and that, looking behind every bush and tree. They kept on thinking they saw things, and there was one time when Polly was perfectly certain she had seen a tall, dark figure gliding quickly away in a westerly direction. But they caught nothing, and in the end Fledge lay down again and the children re-snuggled, if that is the right word, under his wing. They went to sleep at once. Fledge stayed awake much longer, moving his ears to and fro in the darkness, and sometimes giving a little shiver in his skin, as if a fly had landed on him. But in the end, he too slept. Please stop here and answer question 10.